Stevens Home um, was built in part through the support and um, generosity of a previous Serve the World uh, focus. Um, and now this year, our goal and our objective is to, to, ride, to raise $60,000 to help provide two vans that are equipped with the resources needed to transport wheelchairs and, and, um, and to be able to get the residents back and forth to their appointments and to the various places that they need to go in order to continue to support just this incredibly beautiful ministry. And so if this is um, something that you and your family are interested in this this Christmas, um, the easiest way to give to this is on your Chapel Street Church app. If you click on that, you'll see there's a banner that says uh, the Christmas Advent offering. You can just click on that. It'll take you through the steps. If you'd like to write a check or give in a regular offering, you can do that as well. Just please make sure that you designate that as Serve the World um, because we make sure all of those funds um, again, if we raise more than $60,000, those, those excess funds continue to go to partners like um, Stevens Home, who are, are Serve the World partners and, and continue to do more and more work uh, like this and to share more and more of, of these stories. So we're, we're just excited to see how God continues to unfold this story um, in the Ukraine and, and here um, at home as well. And thank you for being a part of that. Last week, if you were here with us, we began our Advent series, um, but, but we did so in a little bit of a unique way. R rather than looking at the entrance of God into human flesh and bone as, as a baby in a manger, some, what we might more typically do is, is a, some of the more traditional texts in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke, we were looking at the Apostle John's description of the, the impact of the arrival of, of God, of the Messiah, under the story, and specifically John's description of, of this arrival of this Messiah of Jesus as the light of the world, saying that, that the light shines in the darkness, if you remember. And the darkness, John writes, has, has not overcome it. And so we're going to continue looking in, in John chapter 1. And you can turn there. We'll read this in, in, in just a minute. Um, when I was in, in college, I, I worked at a coffee shop on Chicago Avenue in Rush, um, right, in, right down by the Water Tower Mall and Michigan Avenue and all the shopping and all that. I was a Moody student. And one evening after work, I don't remember why, it was kind of this time of year, I decided to go out and take a walk and, and was walking down Michigan Avenue and the lights were up and it was beautiful and I was just kind of taking in the scene, getting some fresh air kind of thing. And walking down, I, I had one of those moments, maybe you can relate to this, like you walk by somebody and then you kind of like pause for a second and like, Did I, do I know that person? I like sort of recognized him and I, I stopped on the sidewalk for a second and like thought, kind of did like one of those like double take things. And then I turn around and I see that behind me, and I don't know how I missed this, were like cranes and lifts and TV cameras and lights and all this sort of thing. Like I had literally stumbled into the filming of a scene of the show ER. And, and I walked right by George Clooney, I kid you not. Like, just like, if this is him, this is me. And I'm kind of like, what? Like, like I, I think I forced a retake. Like, I don't know how I did this. Or I am somewhere in an episode of ER that, that we need to go back and look at. But what do you think the first thing I did when I got back to my dorm? What was the first? I, I, you go up, you see your buddies, you're like, you're not going to believe what just happened. Like, I just totally disrupted the filming of, of ER. And I was standing right next to George Clooney, you know? And I like to think that in his, like, he went back to his trailers and he was like, you're not going to believe what happened. I was standing right next to Sterling Moore. And, <laughs> um, but that is our natural reaction, right? When, we, when something unexpected, something extraordinary happens in our life, our tendency, our knee-jerk reaction in that moment is to go and tell somebody, you're not, you're not going to believe what just happened. Now, keep that in mind as, as we read this. I'm going to read once again through kind of the whole section of John 1 that we're focusing on. And then, and then we're going to talk about this little, almost feels like a disruption that he interjects into the middle of the story. This is John chapter 1. 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. And now hear verse 15. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said the one who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Now, if you remember last week, we we focused primarily on those first five verses on John's description of the light entering into the story. And we talked about how John describes this, this event and this person as the logos and this first divine principle and and how the light comes and comes in power john places him not only at creation but as the one doing the creating the word comes in power and he comes in order to bring life and to bring light we 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 talked about the implications of that as we think about what we celebrate and we remember and and talk about when we talk about this promise and this long-awaited Messiah that the people hoped for from generation to generation. But right in the middle of this this description that John is laying out about the word and how it's taking on flesh and becoming one of us, there's this there's this almost sort of like parenthetical kind of, of section there. Matter of fact, if you read this, if, if I read verse 5, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not come overcome it. And I jump right to verse 9, the true light that gives light to everyone who's coming into the world. It flows like perfectly naturally. But verses 6 through 8 kind of stand out as sort of this, this odd diversion where the Apostle John, and this is where things get a little confusing this morning because we're talking about the Apostle John who's writing this account of the life of Christ is now referring to the role of and participation of John the Baptist as as he talks about it, bearing witness to the light. So hear this again, this is verses six through eight. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light, he came only as a witness to the light. So the Apostle John is, is, is pointing out the significance of, of John the Baptist's role in everything that is unfolding here. In fact, it feels so disruptive that the translators in verse 15 of, of the NIV and of the ESV as well, I believe, actually place parentheses around that verse as if it's almost like an addendum to, to what he's writing in and, and wants us to, to think about. And so as, as John is describing this light of the world, as all of this is unfolding in front of us and we're talking about this, the question that we have to ask ourselves is why does he take the time to interject somewhat abruptly the role of, of John the Baptist in all of this? What, what is the purpose of that? Why the interruption? Why is his role as this witness to the light so vital in the story that he's telling? And so that, that really is the question I want us to process together this morning. And, and I want to do that by looking at a two uh, really primary questions or focuses of, of what I think John is describing for us. First, I want us to think about the witness, or really who John the Baptist is. But then secondly, I want us to consider his testimony, what it is that he's telling us or says about the light. 
So let's begin by looking at the witness. The witness. I, uh, um, like many of you, I'm, I'm trying to get all my shopping done right now. And really that is a, um, that's a, that's a pretty easy task for me in the sense that my wife does almost all the shopping for my kids, um, obviously for me and 90% of it for her as well. Um, and yet there are like a few little things that I try to go out and, and do on my own. And, and um, like most of you, I've kind of become accustomed to accomplishing that online, right? I, I do that by just going on the computer, logging in, whatever, checking, searching Google and finding the thing is. But the problem is when you do that, you put in whatever you're looking for, about 8 million options come up, right? Um, in fact, it can be difficult to kind of wade through all of the different things to determine which is the best, the best product, the best fit, the best whatever for whatever it is you're buying. And so what I try to do, and I think many of us do, is I look at the reviews. I, I look at how many stars it gets. And then um, you might even read through some of what people say about the product, right? Which that, that actually can be quite entertaining. I don't know if you read reviews very often, but it is amazing what people will put out there um, and how much time they have to, to do that. But the difficulty in that is I don't know any of those people. I mean, they could be anybody. I have no idea why they bought the product or who it's for or how they're using it or, or if I can trust them. I have no idea if that this is an employee for that company who's putting reviews out there in order to increase sales. I don't know that, that they are a source that I can trust or I could believe. But on the other hand, if I, if I were in a conversation saying, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about getting Sherry a new phone for Christmas. I just don't know what to get. And I was talking to one of you and you were like, well, this is what I got and I love it. And here's what it does. And here's why it works so well. And here's like, that would mean significantly more to me than reading a review online because it's somebody I know. I trust, I can see kind of how they're using it and what they're doing with it. It's somebody that, that is a trusted source. See, as John is telling this story, as, as he's writing down the life of Christ and the significance of what takes place here, he points, he is citing the witness of John the Baptist as a, a sense of validation, as evidence that the word, the logos, the fullness of God has come to be one of us. And it was a source that the people know, those who are reading this account, they had heard of, that they could refer to, and they knew about his ministry and his role in things. There's a couple things about John the Baptist that, that we need to know and, and be aware of as we talk about this. That the reason why sort of John the apostle sets him apart as a valid witness to what's taking place. If you notice in verse six, there's an important description regarding John's role in all of this and the arrival of Jesus in this account, because we're reminded it says that he was a man sent from God. See that, that simple phrase stands out to us in part because we've just heard John describe the arrival of Jesus. And there's this, this, this very distinct between all the creative power of God coming and breaking into the world as light to, to overcome the darkness, a, a, the fullness of God taking on flesh to become one of us. In contrast, then, John the Baptist, he's saying, this is a man. This is just a man. But it is a man who was sent from God. A man who's been set apart, it indicates purpose and intentionality and design in John's role in what's taking place here. God has sent him. In Luke's account of, of the birth of Jesus, Luke takes the time not only to unpack the unique story and circumstances surrounding the arrival of Jesus, but he does so about John's birth as well. Uh, maybe you remember this story, but, but there was a man named Zechariah, a priest, who was faithful. He and his wife, uh, Elizabeth, were um, covenant-keeping followers of, of Yahweh, of God. In fact, Luke describes them as being righteous in the sight of God. 
and yet they were unable to to have children and now in this part of the story they're well beyond the age of being able to bear children and Zechariah one day is working in the temple um, doing his normal routine when the angel Gabriel shows up on the scene and he informs Zechariah he says Elizabeth is going to give birth she's going to become pregnant she's going to give birth to a son and you're going to name him John and there's this it's kind of this funny exchange between Zechariah and, and the angel at the time because well, how, he basically asked, like, how do I know that, how can I be certain of all of this? And Gabriel just sort of like responds like, well, you're talking to an angel to begin with. And, and so he, he actually makes Zechariah be mute all the way up until the point of, of John's birth. But I want you to hear, this is, flip over to Luke chapter one real quick. I want you to hear the description that Gabriel gives to Zechariah about this child that, that he and his wife are gonna have, this son. This is Luke chapter one, verse 16 now. He says, he will bring back many people, many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. Hear this last phrase, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. See, John was sent by God to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And this is what John did. This, this was his role in getting the people ready. When I was in high school, um, it was during a presidential election and my high school had the opportunity to have one of the candidates come and speak at the high school. Um, you know how they go around and speak to different groups of people and they wanted to come and, and speak at the high school. And prior to the arrival of the candidate, this was when it was down to just two people, um, Secret Service came and combed our entire high school. Dogs came through and, and they checked lockers and walked into classrooms and looked everywhere through that high school. Why? To make the place ready. To, to make sure that this place was ready for the arrival of this candidate. This, this is what Luke is describing, what Gabriel describes as this, this child's role, as John the Baptist's role. His job is to get the people ready. And so at this point in time, the people of God, were, they had sort of fallen asleep in their covenant relationship with God. And so John the Baptist is walking around, waking them up. Wake up, people. He said, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. He, he asked the people as part of their, their preparation for the long-awaited Messiah to come and to do his work in the people of Israel to repent from their sins and to, to make their hearts ready for the promise that they longed for their entire lives to be realized. The promise that from generation to generation people would tell their kids that they hoped for that they desired, that they passed on to one another. And he said, it's happening. The time has now come. It's here, so you better get ready. And what's interesting is that this message of John the Baptist, it, it resonated with the people. P people began to respond. They, they began to believe what he was saying. And, and John and acts of repentance is taking people down to the river and he's baptizing them as this expression of of commitment, this expression of repentance and God's covenant design in their lives. And as, as people began to respond to the message, there, there began to be an increased interest. So more and more people are hearing about this. Now there's others who are serving alongside of John in this continued work of, of getting the people ready. People began to, the following began to grow. It began to grow so much so that some people were looking at John the Baptist and began to ask him the question, is it you? You're the one, right, John? Like, you're, you're, you're the one who's going to deliver this promise. In fact, John the Apostle records just one of these instances if you flick back to John chapter 1. This is in verse 19. Some of the leaders of Israel have come and they're, they're trying to inquire about, okay, who, who are you? You've got this 
following now. There's people who are hearing your message. Who are you really? And this is John 1, 19. He says, now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And this is John's answer. He says, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. He's, he's quoting the, Isaiah prophet, uh, the prophet Isaiah. I'm the one, the voice and the one calling in the wilderness makes straight the way of the Lord. See, John's, John's answer could not be more clear here in all of this. He says, it's not me. Uh, my job, I'm here to get the people ready. I am here as a witness to the light, to, to testify, right, that, I, that legal term that, that do, to one who had firsthand knowledge of, um, who, who, who could say from firsthand experience what was going on, I'm here to testify so that through him all might believe. John the Apostle, he points us to the testimony of John the Baptist so that those who read this account, those who listen to this story, who hear him talk about the life of Christ, his entrance into the world, so that they would trust that what he's telling them about Jesus is true. And then this brings us then to the question of, so what, what was his testimony? What, what is the testimony of, of John the Baptist? And that's the second thing that, that we see here. Have any of you ever been called into jury duty? You ever done that before? That, that's quite an experience. Um, I, I got called in somewhat recently and you go and you sit in this room and you're there with me, what feels like maybe a couple hundred other people and they're waiting and, and my mind kind of went to like two, two things um, in that space of so just sitting and waiting for my name to be called. The first was what I could be doing with my day if I wasn't sitting in that room and that kind of ate up most of my mental energy. But the second thing was I, I began to kind of dream about like the courtroom drama that was gonna unfold in front of me, right? Like I, 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 I've watched too much Law and Order or something and I, I place myself in this scene where somebody's on the witness stand and, and the various lawyers are jockeying back and forth trying to, to get them to say what it is that they need them to say to, to make the case. Right, because your job as a juror it really comes down to, okay, what is the law? And then what did the people say happened that were there? Well, what is the testimony of the eyewitnesses? And then thirdly, do we believe it? Are, are, is their testimony believable? Do we believe the account of what they say really happened? In John chapter one, verse seven, speaking of John the Baptist, he came as a witness to testify concerning the light so that through him, all might believe. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is what was his testimony? If you flip over to verse 29 now of John 1, we get an expanded look into this. This is later on now in the life of Christ. But we hear one of the clearest depictions of John's testimony here. It says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now hear this last verse. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. So there's two things that John says here that are so critical in our understanding of, of why the apostle John wants to, to include this. 
right there at the end, he says, I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one, the one that we have been waiting for, the one who is going to restore and redeem and rebuild. It's him. He's here. I'm pointing you to him. And then very early in that text, in verse 29, he says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We're, we're going to talk more about this next week, but the, the heart of, of John the Baptist's testimony about who Jesus is boils down to those two transformational truths. This man that he's been pointing people to, this one that's been walking alongside of him, he's saying, he, he is the Son of God. And not only is he the son of God, but he is the sacrificial lamb that has come to atone for my sins and your sins to pay for all of it on behalf of the world. He he establishes at the outset not only the fullness of who he is, but the purpose of his arrival. So John's testimony is, "I, I am not the light. He's the light. Let me point you to him. Let me prepare the way. He's the one who breaks into the darkness because he is the one who is the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. See, John's participation, his role in all of this is that he serves as a signpost. He he is not himself that which people have come to see. He is directing or pointing them to, to the one that that they need to know. He says, it's not me, it's him. In the early 2000s, there was a um, a marketing strategy by Nike um, about LeBron James. I've actually used this before, but it it struck me as I was talking about this. Um, This was early on in LeBron James' career, and there was a billboard outside of, of the arena in Cleveland that was about 110 feet tall and 220 feet wide and it simply had a a picture of lebron after he'd kind of done his like signature chalk thing with his hands spread open with the phrase we are all witnesses we are all witnesses that that marketing strategy took hold in cleveland people began to buy shirts that simply read witness on it that they had been to a game they had seen the majesty right that was lebron james of course like all chicagoans are like whatever like yeah. But that, that marketing, there, there's something that that was trying to capture in the hearts and the minds of the people about what was taking place there. One was the recognition or the idea that they were in the presence of greatness. That what they were seeing unfold before them wasn't happening everywhere. You are a witness. But secondly, was the idea that that came with an obligation that they had a responsibility, if you will, to tell people about what they had seen. See, what I, what I wanna leave us here with today, when, when John is, is writing about Jesus coming in as the light of the world, as the one who overcomes the darkness, he, he does so by describing him not as one who, this, this flash of lightning that lights up the night sky, but rather as one who illuminates individual souls by extending this invitation into relationship with him, by illuminating individual people with the truth of the gospel and then sending us out to say that we, we too are witnesses. We, we have been, we've encountered greatness and we have an obligation, a responsibility to be a witness to the light. I love how in, in Luke's gospel, in Luke chapter two, there's just this, this brief recognition of this, but you'll remember that, that there are shepherds waiting by, and this is their story. I just wanna, I'll, I'll wrap up with this. This is found in Luke chapter two, verse, um, where am I at? Verse eight. It says, there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes 
and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels left them and had gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. I love just that, that little description right at the end. That is these otherwise unknown people in this story have an encounter with Jesus. Is that their response to that is, is to go and say, you're not going to believe who I just saw. You're not going to believe what just happened. John records John the Baptist coming as a witness, pointing people to the light. As Jesus illuminates our soul with the truth of the gospel, he sends us to do the same. Would you pray with me? Father, we do thank you for this day and this opportunity just to continue just to look at, at the Apostle John's unique depiction of you breaking into the story of this world in order to bring life and bring light. And he gives us this example of one who is sent by you to, to prepare people, to get them ready. But his job, his responsibility in all of that was to point people to you. May the same be true of us. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.